about cover crops that improve vegetable health. And, um, and I'm going to talk about um, concepts, but also research that we've done here in the Mid-Atlantic region um, that I think are, are relevant on our farms here. So um, um, I'm a vegetable plant pathologist. I work for the University of Maryland. I'm in the plant sciences and landscape architecture department. Um, I also have a partial appointment with the University of Delaware, and um, I'm an extension specialist. So I wear many hats, and uh, the, one of the big research areas that I focus on are cover crops and how they impact plant diseases. So um, cover <coughs> crops, of course, have a lot of different benefits in general. Um, they can cut fertilizer costs, reduce, reduce the need for pesticides, including herbicides, um, and insecticides and fungicides, um, or biofungicides, uh, and improve, they improve uh, yields and enhance soil health, um, prevent soil erosion, and they can conserve soil moisture, as well as protect water quality. But the, the aspects that I'm going to talk about are really the aspects that are connected to improving the health of the vegetable plants in your field. Okay. So, um, so what does it mean when we say they can reduce the need for pesticides? So the pesticides would include um, fungicides, regular conventional fungicides if you're a conventional grower, but even biopesticides um, or biorational materials for organic growers. Um, so, you know, uh, first of all, as a scientist, I would say, well, where's the proof of that? And then um, how, does, how does that come about? And then um, enhance soil health. So how does that impact diseases? So if your soil is generally healthier, um, how does that impact the disease on the plant? So um, they, they, they are, I'll show you some evidence, they are, uh, cover crops are good at um, reducing or suppressing um, vegetable plant diseases and they do that several different ways there are several mechanisms and um, I'll go into that in a little bit but in general we believe and have long believed that they encourage beneficial microbes in the soil so um, by enhancing the the beneficial biota microbial communities within the soil um, they may outcompete disease causing organisms um, make it less um, hospitable for those soil-borne diseases to survive and thrive. They sometimes can produce um, compounds that are antagonistic to pathogens such as nematodes. Um, and they can also encourage many kinds of beneficial organisms, whether they're um, beneficial fungi, beneficial uh, nematodes, beneficial bacteria, um, that can compete with the um, pathogens that cause disease. So, um, as I said, I, you know, as a scientist, my first question is always, well, okay, so this is the conventional wisdom. Is it really true? Right? Do, do cover crops really reduce or suppress the pressure of diseases? And so, um, we've looked at a bunch of different path systems, and I'm going to kind of, I'm going to talk about several of the ones here. Um, and then towards the end, I'll kind of summarize all, um, many of the, the, much of the work that's been done, again, within this mid-Atlantic region um, in our soils. So this is a study that we did a while ago where we looked at um, watermelon diseases. You'll see a lot of watermelon data up here, um, but these concepts are more universal than just watermelon. So if you don't grow watermelon, but you grow tomatoes or potatoes, um, these, these concepts will still apply. Um, so we looked at watermelon, and we looked at uh, watermelon grown under sort of the conventional black plastic system, which is the way most of our watermelons in this area are grown. So, you know, the ground is tilled, laid black plastic, and um, plant the transplants into the soil. I think you can see that up here. Okay, so here would be our conventional system. Um, I realize that these slides are a little small, but okay. And then um, we also looked at a no-till hairy vetch system, which you can see over here, um, where we had hairy vetch that was grown, planted in the fall, killed in the spring, and then um, rolled 
and we planted our transplants into that hairy vetch and no-till cover crop. And we looked at um, different diseases, and you can see that the blue is anthracnose here, and the orange is um, from the stem blight. These are both soil-borne organisms. And, oh, that would be great, thank you. Good. Much better, thank you, Fozzie. Okay, so um, the blue is anthracnose, and the red is gummy stem. And you can see that this is under our conventional system. The, this, um, the scale, just to give you an idea, is we call it, this is a plant pathology kind of thing, we call this area under the disease progress curve. And what it represents is sort of the, uh, the whole accumulated disease pressure to the plant over the growing season. So um, rather than being a percent at one point in time, this takes into account, you know, say the epidemic got going and black plastic first, probably did. Um, you might you might miss some of that extra disease pressure if you just look at one point in time. So we like to look at this area under the disease progress curve. But you can see over the course of the whole season that there was significantly less disease pressure on the hairy vetch um, alone, the no-till hairy vetch, for both anthracnose and gummy stem blight. And it was dramatic. So in that case, definitely our, um, the, our only difference was the hairy vetch no-till there and we saw a difference in um, disease pressure. Okay, this is just a different study showing kind of the same thing. This is anthracnose again. Anthracnose is one where we often see differences on our no-till cover crops because, in part because anthracnose is, um, uh, the pathogen is spread by splashing rain. So it kind of makes logical sense that if you have a mat of um, vegetation over the soil surface, uh, the, the splashing, you'll just get a lot less splashing up on the plant. But you can see, um, again, this is watermelon. Uh, there's bare ground up here. So a lot more, here you can see the whole epidemic days after transplanting. You can see the epidemic increase um, on bare ground plots. Here we have black plastic. It's um, significantly less, of course, than the bare ground, um, but, but still quite high. And here's our hairy vetch no-till uh, no hairy vetch mulch um, with much less disease. So again, we saw uh, differences in our uh, disease pressure. And not just in watermelons, this is, um, this is pumpkin. And we looked at plectosporium blight, which is this little fleck disease over here, as well as fruit rot. This happens to be fusarium fruit rot, but um, we also looked at um, black rot and some others as well. And Again, bare ground, significantly more plectosporium and significantly more fruit rot than when we had the no-till. In this case, it was a no-till hairy vetch and rye. So planted in the fall, uh, then in the <coughs> spring, killed and, uh, and rolled down, and our pumpkins planted into it. I really like this uh, system for pumpkins. It's very nice. Um, same study. Uh, and then this is just to show you that we don't just see disease reductions, but we do see improved quality as well. So here you can see the bare ground and the um, hairy vetch cover crop, no-till hairy vetch rye cover crop. You can see there's no difference in yield virtually. Okay? But we did see a significant improvement in the quality of the fruit, which was measured by the, the handles, disease handles or the peduncles right here. So what we often see in pumpkins is that um, there's a, so this is also plectosporium here on the fruit and also here on the handle or the uh, peduncle of the fruit. And um, we'll see a significant improvement in, in quality of handles when we use that no-till system. So, so we do see this difference. Um, and, and like I say, the conventional wisdom is that the um, the, the no-till or even a green manure cover crop is improving the, um, the structure and the activity of the soil microbial community. Um, and that uh, there could also be changes in what organisms grow best and as well as how, how uh, well they're able to grow. And um, so we have done some work on mechanisms of these diseases. But in general, what, what, what our uh, 
initial assumptions are is that we see an increase in the number of good microbes. And that leads to increased microbial competition. And then, incre then in also at the same time, we may see an increase in plant resistance that isn't really related to the microbial comp composition, except that the plant recognizes that there's microbes in the soil and for some reason its defense um, system gets turned on. But all in all, we see a reduction in disease. So, um, so we know cover crops are teeming with beneficial microbes, and um, the microbes break down manure, they break down compost, they increase available nutrients to the plant, and especially uh, micronutrients like boron, calcium, and silicon. There's a lot of research that has been done on these micronutrients that, um, that show that they're related to um, disease suppression and general plant health. So, so one of the mechanisms probably relates to this micronutrient release um, from the cover crops. And then, of course, healthy plants are just better able to defend against attack. So one thing I want to point out is that there's a lot of different cover crops and a lot of different cover crop systems, and they have different kind of, um, uh, different kind of benefits. So, so um, something like graminaceous plants, like rye or cereals, they have relatively high carbon. Um, they're nice from a disease standpoint because when you, uh, if you use them in a no-till system and you mat them down, they, um, they, they have a nice thick layer that um, doesn't break down over the course of the season so that, if, so that if you have, say, rye underneath a pumpkin crop, as the pumpkins mature, they're not, they don't end up sitting on the soil. Um, they still have that, that uh, layer of uh, vegetation that can keep them up off the soil and provide a barrier for some soil-borne pathogens. They also have intensive rooting, and um, that helps improve in soil structure. So leguminous species, they'll have different, different um, kind of benefits. They'll break down quicker. So in our hairy vetch, rye combination is kind of nice because you get the benefit of having that rye that stays intact throughout the growing system. But the legume, the hairy vetch, although it will break down earlier, and by itself, it would not probably protect and leave a barrier all season long. It does provide nitrogen and um, is related to disease suppression in many vegetables. And then um, things like brassica species, mustards and rapeseed, rapeseed type um, um, plants, they also provide disease suppression. Um, they have a breakdown product called isothiocyanate, which is toxic to nematodes. And um, so they can, they have long been associated as being nematode suppressive. What if you're using beneficial nematodes? Would that hurt that as well? <coughs> That's a great uh, question. I actually think it probably would. Okay. Yeah, I would, in that case, I think I would try to steer towards maybe some of the other cover crops. Yeah. Um, and some of these also improve soil structure. You know, there's the tillage radish that we've all heard of and seen a lot of this year um, in, in fields around. That will improve soil structure by, by uh, producing that long tap root that goes down and improves water filtration. So, uh, so using a, a cover crop mixture is actually a good strategy because you can combine some of the benefits of many of these different things. And, as I'll point out later, there are some, there are some negative, um, um, from, the, so from the plant health standpoint, there are some negatives of some of these species. So um, crop mixtures can also kind of mitigate those, those issues. So um, in general, over time, you want to increase the number of, of cover crops used. Um, use cover crop mixtures if you can. And then know the, the biology or the pathogens that are present on your farm. Um, for instance, you know, knowing that, you, that you're trying to enhance beneficial nematodes is, is uh, um, important and it can help steer you in the direction of trying to find the right cover crop. So that's just kind of a conceptual background. What I want to do now is talk about some specific examples and um, then um, talk about some of the uh, trials and uh, research that's been done in the area 
that specifically rates, I know there's a lot of cover crop work that's been done, but I'm going to talk about um, trials and experiments that have done on diseases. So the first example I want to talk about is Fusarium wilt of watermelon. This is a huge problem and becoming more of a problem in our area as we uh, change the, um, the cultivars that are grown. Um, as our growers have gone, they, they used to use resistant diploid cultivars, and I actually think a lot of organic growers still do use diploid cultivars, but um, um, I know that for organic growers, in looking for organic, uh, organically produced watermelon seed, I tend to only be able to find one cultivar, which is sugar baby, which is extremely susceptible to this disease, Fusarium wilt. Okay, so even though it's a diploid variety, it is fully susceptible to this disease, unfortunately. Um, and um, I really, I've always felt that organic growers could benefit from having a greater range of um, germplasm that they could use. Anyway, uh, um, our, even conventional growers used to use resistant cultivars. Now, the uh, seedless cultivars that are grown uh, lack the robust resistance that we used to have, so that's kind of out of the picture. Um, crop rotation, of course, is important, but it's, it's not very effective for Fusarium wilt because uh, the um, pathogen can survive for many, many years in the soil. Fumigation, of course, is out for organic growers and even conventional growers. It's not very desirable. Um, and then, of course, there's grafting, which is good but expensive. But I want to focus on using a uh, cover crop green manure, which has um, um, nice benefits. And we've worked on this system for, for many, many years. And um, we know some about the mechanism of why it works. Vicky Velosa is hairy vetch. Okay. Hairy vetch. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No. I take, yeah, hairy vetch. So this is a hairy vetch green manure. Um, and I would say it's moderate in its effectiveness, but you'll see that. Um, and it, but it has many uh, beneficial attributes. So this is the system. So here's our hairy vetch um, green manure. This is one of the trials that we had. Kind of gives you an idea of what, how, we set, how our system works. Um, we've, we've probably done 15 trials with uh, hairy vetch over the years, at least. So we planted at about 45 pounds per acre, which is kind of a high rate. You can, you know, you can plant it lower, but we, we like that higher rate. Um, here, this, was, this happened to be in a conventional field, so we actually um, have winter fallow and fumigant, but the concept's going to be similar in our organic field. Uh, and here it is. Um, because it was conventional, we sprayed it. But you can crimp it and roll it. You can get rid of it other ways than, than the gramoxo. Um, and then, once it's killed, you till it under, and it looks pretty much like our, the, the uh, uh, other treatment. Um, we wanted to try to eliminate confusing the effect of the hairy vetch with the effect of nutrients. So we um, um, estimated how much nitrogen was, um, was in the hairy vetch uh, cover crop green manure. And then we uh, supplemented our winter fallow treatments with that much nitrogen. And so, of course, again, we're using conventional or inorganic uh, nitrogen sources, but, um, but that doesn't change the um, results of what we saw, I don't believe. And then we laid plastic just like a, a grower would and planted our transplants in. So, later in the season, um, you can already see a difference in the growth of the, uh, no t the uh, green manure uh, cover crop. Okay, so here's soil amended with the uh, hairy vetch, and uh, this plot here happens to be unamended. And you can see this one already looks more uh, robust, maybe it's vining a little bit better. And if you look down this one, you can see these kind of grayish patches here. Those are all places where Fusarium wilt has started. So there, we say disease foci, or the, the uh, place, that epicenter sort of, of where the hairy vetch has, or where the Fusarium wilt has begun. And we do see it, of course, here in, in our uh, hairy vetch, our hairy vetch um, cover crop plots. 
uh, you know, these, this is by no means a 100% control measure or anything like that. Um, it's just that the, the, the disease is suppressed. So this is what it looks like. Graphically, like I say, it's not 100%. So let me, this is a little complicated. This is our percentage of wilt here. And you can see that we had a lot of wilt. That field that I showed you in the last picture actually is very heavy inoculum pressure. Um, the bare ground disease is this top line here. So here's the epidemic weeks after transplanting. You can see the disease is starting to heat up. Here's our, this is our bare ground plot. So this would be this or the rye. A lot of um, conventional growers will use um, will use rye, this um, which is the gray line. So those two, I would say, would be sort of our controls, like the typical grower practice. This um, this is our mustard, Brassica gentiae. Here you can see that had a lot of wilt. I'll talk a little bit about that one in, in the, the future. That's kind of an interesting situation. These two down here, though, the stars mean that it significantly has signif those plots had significantly less disease than our um, bare ground plots. And you can see that the two treatments where we saw significantly less disease was our hair and batch, Vicky velosa, and then this one's crimson clover. Um, crimson clover looked really nice in this study as well. Okay, so the hairy batch is this blue, a little bit lighter blue. Um, overall, it was probably the best. Uh, this one is the crimson clover, bounced around a little bit, but um, had significantly less wilt than our bare ground plot. So that's, this is pretty typical of what we've seen in those many trials. I'm obviously not going to show you all, all our 15 trials of data, but this gives you an idea of what we see and how the different cover crops compare. So I had a student that finished up a couple years ago and she, she had seen this data and was interested in what was the mechanism of suppression. So her, her thought was, okay, so sometimes we, we say disease um, suppression is a general suppression and sometimes we say it's a specific suppression and could she kind of sort out and figure out what was going on in this um, hairy vetch situation. So um, she said, okay, well, there could be a lot of things going on, right? Um, we could be increasing soil respiration, which would indicate that we're enhancing the general microbial community within the soil. Whoops, I get that far. Okay. Um, or the hairy vetch could, <coughs> as, as it rains, it, the leachate could be leaching out and maybe we're getting something like the mustard situation where you're getting some kinds of um, toxic compounds um, coming off the leachate. Or, um, or so micro, mycorrhizae, you know, we think that's, that mycorrhizae are, we know that mycorrhizae are associated with reduced um, fusarium wilt and other diseases. And so, you know, maybe there's some differences in um, so mycorrhizae following these cover crops. So she did a bunch of experiments. Uh, this is her data on soil respiration, some of it. Um, so the first question was, would we, would we see a general suppression when, um, after the uh, cover crop was tilled into the soil or even before? Um, and her results were very interesting. So this contraption, measures soil respiration. It actually measures the amount of CO2 and it comes off. And how it works is that the day before you use it, you go out and you pound in some little um, collars, PVC collars into the soil. The, you have to put them in the soil and let the soil re-equilibrate because the act of pounding them into the soil disturbs the soil enough that it changes the um, information that you get. But then you come out the next day and put this cap on and um, it will measure the amount of CO2 that is um, being generated from the soil. And this is what she saw. Uh, this, this arrow shows you when tillage occurred. Okay. So um, tillage is occurring between right before the eight, uh, 28th of May. So here it starts out low, but uh, um, this actually we did see a significant, significantly higher CO2 um, soil respiration rate from the crimson clover um, than we did 
from the other ones at this early date. And that was also true at her um, just following uh, tillage. And we always saw the spike right, right after tillage, which makes sense. You know, you put all that organic matter and green manure into the soil and all of your, you know, and any, any treatment um, is going to increase respiration because the soil microbes are going to go to work on that. So we always see the spike, but what was interesting was the magnitude of the spike was not always the same. So here, there are significantly more, again, in the crimson clover um, treatments. And then this goes over the course of the season, and um, you can kind of see how that looks. Okay, this is, um, this is more so respiration data, and I know this is a busy slide. I just want to point out the, the um, whoops. Here, there was crimson clover that was high. In her other um, trials, some of the other trials that she conducted, um, hairy vetch also came out as being very high in soil respiration. So um, here at a different site, um, hairy vetch <coughs> extremely high. Crimson clover um, was more intermediate in most of these. Let's see if I... Um, I thought maybe I had another slide. But um, um, hairy vetch tended to be the highest, followed pretty closely by um, the crimson clover, and then bare ground, much, much lower. Um, but even our um, brassica, our mustard, and rye tended to be more intermediate. And these two, the ones where we had the highest soil respiration overall, in general, um, were also where we were seeing disease suppression. Is that related all to soil moisture or anything about the soil itself? So she did do soil moistures, and there was there were not. Um, no. no. <laughs> was that? Was that all at the same farm or that first one where you had such a high with the crimson clover? That's at Lazarek as well. No, that was at um, Beltsville. So it was a different soil. Type. It was a different soil type. Type, yes, definitely. Yep. Yeah. And so the the. Um, this was at Beltsville. Oops. These were. This is Salisbury, Salisbury, and this one's at Georgetown. So they're all. So there's three different soil types. Okay. Um, but that's a good point because actually this suppression, the Fusarium wilt suppression, is dependent on the location, which is very interesting. We sometimes don't. I had a have a friend in South Carolina, and we had a grant together to work on this um, many years ago. He tried it in South Carolina and it didn't work there. So there's something different about our soils here that, that is not going on down there. So. Um, okay, so um, the suppression then, it, um, so one of her questions, Jennifer's questions uh, was, is the suppression general or specific? So this data would indicate that there's a general aspect to it, that is that there's something going on that's just elevating the microbial activity in the soil and that that is having a generalized suppressive effect against um, plant pathogens. But, of course, there's no absolutes, and I, I always like to say, you know, it's probably a continuum. And so she also looked at um, the activity. She, she was interested in some specific antagonists. Um, and so she looked, I'm not going to show you the data on this, but she did look at non-pathogenic fusarium species and they, in fact, were enhanced by the um, incorporation of uh, um, the hairy vetch and crimson clover cover crop. And she also looked at Trichoderma hartsianum. Um, that she didn't look at in soil. She looked at it on plates. But um, leachate from uh, the hairy vetch and crimson clover cover crop actually enhanced Trichoderma as well. So there could be a specific access. Uh, aspect of this suppression. I'm sure there is. And she also looked at mycorrhizae. And here, is, so here's her treatments again. So here's hairy vetch, crimson clover, rye, mustard, and then the bare ground. It's a busy slide, so um, just um, I wanted to highlight the, uh, the two treatments where we saw suppression, and you can compare them a little more easily to the bare ground or the rye where we don't see suppression, okay? So um, uh, what this data is, is it's, she, she examined the roots and looked at the, um, and divided it into specific nodes and looked to see whether there was mycorrhizae 
at each specific node. And so with this 14% here on bare ground means that that about 14% of the nodes that she looked at were she could she could visualize a interaction between the mycorrhizae and the root and uh, at this particular site and when she looked at the roots that came from the crimson clover or hairy batch um, significantly more of those nodes had this interaction so she could visualize the interaction at um, almost 60 percent of the crimson clover uh, roots that came from the crimson clover green manure plots and um, uh, even even similar amounts from the hairy batch plot. And then at a different site, um, this again was at the Beltsville Research Farm, about 25% of the roots that came from the bare ground treated plots had this, had um, those nodes had interactions with uh, mycorrhizae versus watermelon roots that came from the crimson clover and the hairy batch where, um, again, about double at the crimson clover and the crimson clover um, green manure plots, and then uh, even more significantly higher in the hairy vetch uh, cover crop plot. So as I said, we know that, um, that, an inter that mycorrhizae interactions help uh, a plant ward off disease, and so there's no doubt that these were beneficial in uh, reducing the amount of fusarium wilt that we were seeing. <laughs> Okay, so that indicates that there was also a specific suppression. Um, so another example I want to show you is root knot nematode. Um, this is a serious problem in our area as well. Uh, you can see the, the roots here with the big root knots on them. This is a potato plant, and these, these uh, bumps here are actually root knot nematode galls on the tuber. And that's, uh, this is a potato that's a pin, and there's the female root knot nematode there. Um, Meloidogyne incognita is the, the root knot that we have here in our region. So um, I'm, I'm showing you potato because we, this project came about because some growers started growing potatoes for the first time, and they were having lots and lots of problems with root knot, and they came and asked if we would um, look at this and see if there were some um, cover crop strategies that they could use. And uh, so that's how this project was initiated. Um, it was done a while ago. Uh, this, these were my collaborators. Uh, so what we did was we looked at a whole bunch of different cover crops. And this is a picture of, we have some, we have microplots at the farm that I work at uh, that are infested with nematodes. And so what we did initially is to look at our at our cover crops in these microplots, and then we took that initial information that we had and went to some growers' fields. We had two growers that worked closely with us. So, um, so anyway, the cover crops that we use. Let's see if I can show you here. Um, so these were the treatments that we had, and it, it was a very complicated design of our experiment, but um, I think I can explain it well. So we were look, we were interested in some crops. So they grew soybean. Um, we picked oats because it's a non-host of southern root knot, and we thought it might be interesting, and it was a possible a possible um, cover crop, or not cover crop, but um, rotation crop that they could get some uh, economic benefit from. So we wanted to look at that. Potato was what they were really most interested in. Uh, we looked at sorghum Sudan grass. And we looked at castor bean. I don't know if any of you are familiar with castor bean. That's this plant here. It's, um, it's actually a subtropical plant that it's, it looks nice and small there. It grows to about 15 feet high, and it has a huge, almost woody stem that was very difficult to deal with. Turned out to be great for the nematodes, but um, I don't think it's really a viable cover crop. Um, then uh, we, ha we looked at grain sorghum as well, again, looking at an economic crop. Okay, so this is the design of our experiment, and don't get too uh, lost in the detail, but basically, again, we had soybean. We had also a resistant soybean that we wanted to look at. Uh, Minokin, it was bred by the University of Maryland. Um, soybean breeding uh, group. We looked at castor bean, uh, sorghum sudan grass, grain sorghum, and sorghum sudan grass. 
and then we had bare ground, of course. And then these are the treatments were, or Sudan grass was repeated. We wanted to look at the impact of poultry litter and poultry litter compost because they were both available widely within our region to our farmers. So, um, and, and they're interesting because we know that nematodes are, use, are uh, thrive in sandy, low organic matter soil. So um, the strategy was that if you could increase the organic matter, uh, either with the poultry litter or the poultry litter compost, that you might be able to suppress <coughs> nematodes as well. And then um, we would have a, uh, a winter cover crop, um, oats usually, although we had one treatment with canola. <coughs> And this was just to parse out so that we could say, okay, well, what's the effect of Sudan grass by itself? Or what's the effect of poultry litter by itself? Or poultry litter compost? Um, so that's why the treatments are so complicated. Um, so the first year we had potato, and the second year our economic crop was cucumber, and then we repeated all of these treatments again. So we do all our cover crop treatments again, our poultry litter, poultry litter compost, and then our... Um, winter cover crop again. And then uh, the third year, um, we planted potato in the spring. Again, the growers are most interested in the potato situation. And then we followed that with soybean. And all of them were the um, susceptible soybean, except for one, we did have one um, treatment with minoke. All right, yeah. Okay, so this is what we saw, whoops. Okay. Um, so this, to, to get your bearings here, this is um, a rating for uh, the root knot nematode. And um, the sort of the control plot, I would say, would be this, this is the uh, susceptible soybean, okay? And that's the, this treatment right here. And you can see it's one of the higher ones, not surprisingly, it's a good host. and. Um, the nematode levels stay high on that. Okay, grain sorghum also would be more standard treatment. Again, high nematode levels there as well. And this is this is taking in, this is the first year, right, around here, second year, and then the third year. So you can see our, our numbers started out similar, which is good. That means we didn't have a lot of variation um, initially, so that we could see better treatment effects. The treatments that decreased nematode levels were, um, the yellow one is minokin, that's our resistant soybean, so that's not too surprising. Um, the blue one is the sorghum sudan grass. It looked pretty good, although well, I'll say something about year three in just a minute. Okay, and then the fourth one was the castor bean, which is the one that I said was really difficult to deal with, and it stayed low where we had, the two years where we had the cover crop. Remember the third year, though, we, um, we um, went back to a regular potato um, conventional system and took out the cover crops. So what you can see here is that as long as the cover crops were there, we were driving down our nematode numbers. But when we took it away, the nematode levels really rebounded. So I, I would say that these, these uh, things worked well, but the effect was very transient. transient. So, um, our best treatments were the resistant soybean. The resistant soybean, you'll see, just a second here, let me go back. Oops. Going forward. Okay, the resistant soybean stays low. That's because in the, in the third year, this still had the resistant soybean in the plot, whereas all of these had the susceptible soybean. Okay, so resistant soybean, it worked great. Um, uh, you need to be aware, though, that it's resistant to root knot nematode and soybean cyst nematode, but it's susceptible to lesion nem nematode, so it's not a, a be-all and end-all solution either. Castor bean worked great, but as I say, it, it could be difficult to incorporate. Also, this um, it's actually a toxic plant. You may have heard of ricin, which is a poison, which can be um, uh, uh, gotten from this plant. Um, and, it, and it, all the plant parts are toxic to animals if they eat at a high enough level, especially the seeds. So um, it, has, it has some negatives associated with it. Sorghum Sudan grass, um, I, th I thought was the most viable um, 
one of these treatments. It, it worked good at suppressing the nematode, and especially, I didn't show you the data, but especially if you combined it with poultry litter or poultry litter compost, so you could um, put more organic matter in the soil, you got a very nice suppression of nematodes. Again, it's transient, so you'd have to use it, uh, you know, not every year, but have it in your rotation um, to get that benefit and to maintain that benefit, but it was nice. Um, rapeseed also worked well, um, and it also has the added benefit that, that um, it's been known to suppress rhizoctonia in some other studies that have been done. So that was our nematode work. I just want to kind of, okay, I have plenty of time, um, talk about some other research trials in less depth, but just talk about what we have found over the years. So we've also looked at no-till cover crops for um, uh, pumpkins, and that system is really nice. Um, we like the hairy veg plus rye um, cover crop, uh, no-till. So, are there any conventional growers here, or is everybody organic? Okay. There's a little conventional trick you can use, but it's not available for organic. But uh, anyway, so the no-till hairy vetch and rye system is really nice. You get a, um, you get a nice thick mat that forms underneath your pumpkin fruit, and a lot of diseases that go to the that become problems on the fruit are soil-borne, and they're splash dispersed. So, um, so it's reducing splash dispersal and um, improving the health of, of the plant. Also, keeping it up on that vegetative mat might al might be altering the uh, microclimate around the fruit as well, and keeping it a little less humid so that um, the pathogens are less likely to be able to invade. <coughs> so we've seen reductions in plectosporium, that's this disease here, um, southern blight, black rot, um, and some other fruit rots. We also see, um, oh, and I should mention that if you can, if you can get a powdery mildew resistant pumpkin cultivar to, to plant, that, it is, that really makes the whole system very, very nice. So um, you can reduce the fruit rots with your um, your cover crops, your no-till cover crops, and then you can use your genetics of your uh, pumpkin plant, and there's some nice powdery mildew resistant um, varieties that are out there right now, so that you can reduce some of these foliar diseases as well. Okay, tomatoes. This, um, years and years ago, I worked with um, some folks at Beltsville on the steak tomato project, looking at no-till cover crops. I think that maybe even was one how I got into the cover crop, uh, interested in cover crops to begin with. But anyway, they had a great system where they would plant um, hairy vetch, and um, it would be killed, rolled, and then steak tomatoes were planted into it. Um, and they could measure reductions in uh, a lot of diseases. Septoria leaf spot, as well as early blight, um, were both lower in their no-till hairy vetch plots. And um, this is a picture, this is actually a drawing of Septoria, and I just included it because, again, this disease can be, can be windborne, but it also can be splash dispersed, you can imagine. So if this is a, some leaf residue that's uh, in or, or on the soil, um, and uh, you get rain coming down here, it's going to be splashing these spores up onto the leaves and uh, <coughs> causing a lot of problems. So the no-till hairy vetch, they... Um, uh, Doug, who was a postdoc who worked with me on that project, um, they could measure that, that the soil splash, he measured that, that uh, the dispersal, soil splash was reduced on the no-till hairy vetch um, plots, or yeah, on the plants that were grown in the no-till hairy vetch, and uh, speculated that that was one of the reasons that we were seeing a reduced reduction in disease. And then also in his work, he showed that the humidity in the canopy was also reduced in one year out of the study, um, which may have also been one of the mechanisms that uh, led to the reduction in the foliar disease. All right, this is a very complicated slide. I think it's my last one maybe, so I'm just gonna walk through it real slowly. Um, the, um, these, are, these are just some selected no-till cover crop green manures um, combinations that have been tried and worked really well here um, in the Mid-Atlantic region, and I'll just make some comments about them. 
So again, sorghum Sudan grass is um, suppressive to nematodes on many crops, uh, as well as bean root rot. And the, um, the suppression, as I mentioned, is enhanced if you can do something else to add organic matter to the soil, such as um, poultry litter compost. And in other regions and other studies, it's also been um, led to a reduction in fungal diseases of lettuce and potato. So it has lots of benefits. It's a nice one. Brassica, brassica species like mustard and rapeseed are also very good on, on root knot nematode suppression. And um, they, uh, that crops also, those species have also been um, associated with reductions in rhizoctonia. Um, on potato and Fusarium oxysporum, Rhizoctonia solana, and Verticillium on um, potato. So another another good one. Um, but you saw in the uh, Fusarium wilt trials that it did not suppress Fusarium wilt. So again, you know you kind of have to be familiar with what your your disease spectra are on your on your field. Harry Vatch, I really like that one um, for again for Fusarium wilt. It works really well, and hairy vetch is also the one that was used on the tomato trials at Beltsville and reduced foliar disease. So um, it's got a lot of benefits. Um, the response on fusarium wilt is location dependent. As I mentioned, it didn't work in South Carolina. Um, and the other thing is hairy vetch is a host of root knot nematode. So there is one um, cultivar, which you can get, called Cahaba White, which has resistance to root knot nematode. So, you know, if that's, if, if root knot nematode is a problem, but you want to use it for, say, the fusarium milk suppression, there's, um, there's that option. And that cultivar performs very well as well. Um, crimson clover, I really like the crimson clover. It also suppresses fusarium wilt, probably not quite as much as the hairy vetch in our region, but, um, but we have been able to measure suppression with that particular cover crop. Mixed hay species, I, um, I actually didn't talk a lot about it because it's a little easier to study one single species. Um, so us scientists tend to do that, but I really, I really believe in mixed species cover crops because I think you can get the benefits of um, a bunch of different cover crops at the same time. But this mixed hay species reduced damping off of tomatoes. That research was actually done in Ohio. And what they had in the mix was tall fescue, orchard gra grass, timothy, red clover, and alfalfa. So um, they had six uh, species mixed together. Um, the hairy vetch and hairy vetch plus rye um, combination I really like on pumpkins. That reduced black rot, anthracnose, and plectosporium blight. Um, and I talked about this, it, it provides that matte layer in between the fruit and the soil, which seems to reduce splash dispersal. Um, we've measured a reduction in edema. Edema, um, edema is, um, I don't know how many of you are pumpkin growers, but edema is like a little uh, sort of bubbling that happens on the surface um, of the pumpkin fruit sometimes. And um, we actually uh, have seen a reduction in that sometimes on the cover crop, although I had a grower tell me once that he thought it was worse in his cover crop, so maybe, maybe not rely on that. Um, hairy vetch, again, no-till on the tomato. Um, and then sun hemp, <coughs> I didn't talk about this. Saruti Hooks is talking in a room not too far from here. He's done some work on sun hemp, which is a tropical species, uh, uh, and uh, uh, looked at it for suppression of root knot nematode and done some nice work there. So um, these are just uh, some, some things that have been done within the region that you can see on uh, diseases of vegetable crops. When you talked earlier, you said you um, believe that mixing some or having some mixed cover crops was a good idea. So of all these, which combinations of mixing <laughs> goes together? So like I say, I really like the mixed um, vetch and rye on pumpkin because you get the you get the benefits of both, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's kind of a good combination. If 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 I was starting, um, I would put in I guess I would put in I would I would put in a legume and a cereal. Um, that would be my first thought. Uh, so you had a lot of good things to say about the sudan grass. Do you think that works 
as well with Dutch? Actually, um, you know, we have never tried that particular combination, but I think I would. That would I, I do like Sudan grass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think you'd have to maybe play with your planting rate a little bit because you're right. The Sudan grass gets really big, and yeah. the vetch is just very low. But um, but it, it, that could be a beneficial so combination. So people haven't really played around with too many different mixes. Is that it? I haven't. Um, um, this trial in Ohio seems one. We, and you know, we tried to replicate that here. We actually did. Um, we got all these, these uh, things and, and um, mixed them together and tried it um, two years at our farm. And unfortunately, we didn't get a lot of disease, so I didn't talk about that. <laughs> so our, everything looked healthy, right? <laughs> we, had it on we had tomatoes on it, and they all looked really nice. But even the uh, bare ground plots looked nice, so it was hard to, it was hard to make any conclusions. Um, okay, so I do want to just uh, say a few things about uh, things to keep in the back of your mind is that sometimes they ca uh, cover crops can increase diseases. So um, I didn't talk about it, but the brassica species um, that we used in Jennifer's trials did increase fusarium wilt in, um, in significantly in one of our trials. Um, and we think that maybe it happened because it's not a good host for mycorrhizae. And so, again, remember the mycorrhizae in those, um, those cover crop plots on watermelon tended to be low. And so we think maybe um, the mycorrhizae populations were being decreased following the uh, mustard. And so, you know, if you want to use a mustard, I would say, not, not a problem, just maybe use it in a, a mixture. You know, so put in, um, um, something with it that's going to uh, have mycorrhizae associations and, in, and uh, other attributes that the mustard might not have. Um, I just read a paper <laughs> that's brand, hot off the press, um, 2016, where uh, that came out of, this is actually out of Iowa. Um, so their soils are different than ours. They tend to be colder and their growing season is not as long, but I still think it's worth mentioning that they used a rye cover crop, which is really probably one of our most common ones here. Um, and corn seedling diseases after, of course, this is field corn they're talking about, but corn seedling diseases were increased. So Fusarium graminearum, they, they measured um, and quantified Fusarium graminearum, Fusarium oxysporum, and two Pythium species that increased following their rye cover crop incorporation. So, um, and, but you'll notice that these are, right, these are both, um, crops and so their pathogens are more similar so be aware of that and think about the economic crop you're going to put in afterwards um, and some of their take-home messages were that now they didn't talk about using a non zero crop because they're they're talking about huge farms that plant corn and corn right um, but um, uh, growers here can certainly use a non cereal cover crop before sweet corn, say. Um, and they could also, and also here our growing season is a little bit longer, so we could play with the uh, interval between when the cover crop is incorporated and when our economic crop is planted so that you can maybe minimize that problem. All right, and I just wanted to, I guess I'm ending on maybe a negative note, I just wanted to mention that, this, don't, don't even read this list, but I, I put together a list of vine crop diseases, so this would be cucurbit diseases mm -hmm. that I could think of off the top of my head, just to make the point that there are many, many, many diseases. And um, um, so when you think about your cover crops, you have to kind of have in the back of your mind that, that uh, some cover crops are going to be more beneficial if you have high populations of some of these pathogens, and others will be more beneficial if you have high populations of other of these pathogens. So. Um, do you so, think many of these are seed corn? Yes. Well, some are. Not all of them, but certainly Fusarium is. Um, yeah. So is there anything that an organic grower could do? Like, is there like a heat treatment of the seed or anything to oh, do yes. to prevent that from the seed source? 
So, um, so on vine crops, you can't you can't hot water treat cucurbit crops, but tomatoes, peppers, many many vegetable crops you can, and that's a really uh, good strategy. And I think maybe two years ago I uh, did a demonstration at this meeting on hot water seed treatment. So that's a good strategy. Unfortunately, you can't you can't uh, hot water seed treat any big seeded crop like corn or cucurbit because it'll kill the seeds. So, um, so you have to have other strategies. Uh, so this was just to point out that you need to uh, keep an open mind that sometimes your cover crop might not be uh, be able to handle everything. And so, um, to your point, actually, you need to think of everything you have in your toolbox. So I would advocate using host resistance when you can find um, good cultivars or varieties that have host resistance. Keep in mind your crop rotation. Make sure you have a good crop rotation. That's kind of the problem that they had with the rye cover crop and then the um, corn right afterwards was they're too closely related. Um, and then of course have a nice cover crop strategy and plan in place where you use mixed cover crops and alternate your cover crops over time, clean seed, and then um, if, if necessary, there are some biorational fungicides that can be used by organic growers in season to help um, with that big spectrum of diseases that you have to manage. All right. I yes. have a question about the hairy vetch and the kill down on that in organics. And you were talking about, um, you said kill down and then crimp. What were you what so, advocating as kill down? Roll, roll, um, roll and crimp. The, the way that we usually handle it in the organic system is to roll it and crimp it. So there's machinery that can go over it, roll it, and crimp it at the same time, which hopefully will kill the, the um, plants. You could also flail mow it, I guess, if you felt like it was um, not going to kill the kill the plant enough. I, the, the concern that I hear from growers about vetch is they don't like that hard seed um, and that it can come back and regrow. So It does a lot. It's, it's a very persistent, aggressive seed. Mm -hmm. So yeah. maybe a strategy would be to mow it and just leave the residue on the ground. Um, that might be something to try. <laughs> Thanks very much.